Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Anna Spooner from the Wine Society, for those of you I've not met before, and I'm joined this evening by Benjamin from the Fine Cheese Company. So good evening, Benjamin. Cheers. Good evening. Cheers. Lovely stuff. Um, first things first, before we even get on to the, to the event, many of you may have not seen Benjamin since he... Uh, since he had a baby. So congratulations, Ben. And uh, we're delighted to have you back. And uh, I know it's been a little while since since we've had you, but for members that weren't aware, that's why. Because uh, Ben's been playing dad. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, so that is why we haven't, we haven't had an event in a while. But I have to say, I'm really excited about this one. It's, um, it's the time of year where I really start to think about cheese as a meal <laughs> um or at least I start to think about a whole plate of cheese to indulge in front of the fire or in front of the tv even if it has been unseasonably warm today um I'm quite glad that we haven't got too many hearty hearty wines there are some big wines but actually it's been quite nice and it is rather warm uh oh gosh I've just seen somebody in Newcastle's having their last barbecue of the year so wow. really is unseasonably warm um, and they're from Newcastle as well so brave uh but on that note well done for those of you already using the chat you can let us know where you are what you're drinking and if you're having a barbecue in the northeast of England <laughs> in nearly November so there we are uh, but I'm actually managing the behind the scenes tonight. So more than ever, members, if you have a question, i.e. you want something to be asked of Ben and I, please, please, please do try and pop that into the Q&A box. I've got both laptops up, so I am going to try and manage the chat as best I can. Uh, I've, you know, It's nice. I can listen to Ben and have a look at the same time. But please, if it's a burning question, if you can use that Q&A button, that will really help us out. So, um I think probably uh, oh, one more one more thing to mention. Ben will talk about it, but many of you will have spotted my email. And if you haven't and you've opened the cheese, we have got one swapped cheese this evening, but I'm really excited to try it. It's a new one for me. So I'm staring at it longingly. Um, and we've also got I think most people will have the original four wines. But right at the end of the promotion of this event, two of the wines did uh, sell out. So if you didn't manage to get the Rustenberg, I did replace it with another South African majority Stellenbosch Chardonnay. Slightly different in style, but I'm going to talk about both of them. And if you didn't manage to get another South African, which I didn't think about at the time, but I was obviously in a South African mood. Uh, if you didn't manage to get the Vergelen, Verge, oh, it's going to it's going to play havoc with me today South African Merlot Vergelegan um, that I have suggested an alternative which is the Bogle Merlot again it's lovely new world rich and I'll talk about why that's important when we get to it so hopefully you've got four wines I have six um, but that's because I'm going to talk about both but if you just have one two and a plate of cheese then welcome and I think we're going to have a lovely evening so without further ado, I'm going to pop up. I'm going to talk wine first and then hand over to Ben. So I'm going to quickly do a double wine. Um, so we're going to start with the Rustenberg. Now, I did mention on the email, I swapped the tasting order around ever so slightly. The reason being that actually uh, I do have a sneaky suspicion and I've not tried it yet, but I have a sneaky suspicion that our, um, not only with our, will our, um, pardon me, uh, Spanish wine go with our new Spanish cheese I also think that the um, the Chianti will as well so I swapped the the Spanish wine in so we're going to have both wines with that um, Ben's going to help me with the pronunciation of that cheese in a minute <laughs> but before we start with that we've got uh, we're going to start with the Rustenberg Chardonnay and the Aslina Chardonnay and those two wines are going to be going with the St. Jude so uh, Ben's going to talk about that in a moment, but let's start with the wines. The reason I'm saying start with the wines is I really want you to notice how hopefully some of these wines, particularly as we get later on, some of these wines really, really, really change with the cheeses. I had a lot of fun doing the pairings for these ones. So, um, yes. <laughs> but first things first, we've got the Rustenberg Chardonnay, which you can see on your screen. This was a Wine Champs winner. Uh, it was also the wine that I served at my wedding. Uh, actually, not this vintage. I, it was the 2019, but I believe the 19 was also a wine champ. I think it's sort of a serial champion winner. And so we stock it every year. It's an absolutely beautiful wine. 
Um, I will just show you a picture as well so you can visualise where this wine comes from, which makes me absolute wonderlust uh, to, to get into the sunshine of South Africa. 100% um, Chardonnay. It's grown on this decomposed granite soil, which gives this lovely richness. It is a minimal drip irrigation. Now, the reason I mention that to you is, is um, you can, in Stellenbosch in South Africa, should you wish, you can irrigate your vines. And that's going to um, allow the grapes to grow in really, really drought ridden years, of which there have been many, 15, 16, 17, I think 18, all drought ridden, um, if that's the right term. This has had minimal drip irrigation. So they've allowed the vines to continue to survive in this very dry climate, but they are not putting too much water into the ground. So that gives you really, really concentrated fruit. It's hand picked as well. It's pressed in whole bunches. And that's why they have to hand pick it. They have to get the stem. And what that does is it brings this real. Um, I've done a very geeky session on what whole bunches do, but for white wines, it tends, tends to bring this purity of fruit because the, the whole bunches act like little streams or channels where the juice can leak through. Um, so what can we actually taste in here? Well, first of all, it was fermented in a barrel. Why is that important? Well, we aged it in a barrel as well. And they tend to think that if you ferment it in a barrel and age it in a barrel, it um, brings a nice synergy to the wine. And the barrel that they aged it in uh, it was 12 months. And it was in French oak, 300 litre French. And the reason I mention that is it's giving this beautiful kind of rich vanilla, um, sweet spice, that kind of character. 25% of the oak was brand new. So it's imparting lots and lots of flavour. And the rest was uh, second, third, fourth fill. So no really old oak. They're, they intentionally want to bring the flavour here. Remember, we've got those concentrated berries, really pure juice from the whole bunch pressing. So it can take a little bit of oomph. Um, so it smells, it smells decadent. It smells rich. It's also had, and I think this is important for the reason I chose it with St. Jude more than anything. It's gone through 100% of what they call malolactic fermentation or malolactic conversion. And for that reason, it sort of smells a little bit cheesy and a little bit yogurty. Um, and I think with the richness and the creaminess of that cheese, that's really, really important. Um, it, it's nice sometimes to have a creamy cheese with a, I don't know, I, I love a very, very rich, creamy, almost liquid goo cheese with something like a champagne that cuts through the fat. But here you have got enough of that high acidity but the wine and the cheese, are they're more that they're similar rather than um, a sort of opposites attract. Here I've tried to pair two things that have a kind of similar character, sweet, milky, unctuous. Um, it was also aged on the lees. So it was aged on the dead yeast cells. And more than anything, that's going to bring a beautiful, um, rich mouthfeel to the wine. So let's have a taste after I've banged on about it for so long. Um, I've got beautiful aromas in there. It's kind of green apple, but also peach, um, guava, lemon, melon, lots and lots of fruits, but with those buttery popcorn notes almost. And then. Mm, it's got that amazing richness. My mouth is full, but can you. It's it's almost like the the acidity at the end has been so well considered that it's got um, how would I describe it? It's almost like a lemon twist at the end, um, this sort of citrus burst. Um, ben, I'm intrigued to hear what you think about it. Yeah, I mean it's right up my street, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when we spoke about wines last Christmas, I think it was this is like just the just my kind of wine. And it's absolutely delicious. And I think, yeah, that, that acidity right at the end is is absolutely gorgeous. It kind of, and I get the vanilla through, but then you just have this like, like hit at the end of, of citrus. And I, I really like that. It's like a bit of a journey. Yeah, I agree. It's, it, it's not one flavour that stays one flavour. You do get this um, great little mixture. You get the creaminess on the nose, the richness, and then yes, the final finish that you're left with is that persistent lemony 
it, I, so I can still taste it. And the other thing about the yeast, not only does it bring um, body, but those dead yeast cells, the leaves also add a little salty finish as well. I don't know whether you're getting that tiny touch of salinity that I think is fabulous. It makes you salivate. Um, make, it does make you salivate, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So just before, I'll tell you what, I'll talk, I'll just quickly mention about Rustenburg, the place, because it is fabulous. Um, and then I'll talk about Aslina as well and why I chose this as a, another wine. And then I'll let you talk about cheese, Ben. I'm excited. <laughs> um, but Rustenburg is family owned uh, by the Barlow family. They actually, the estate started producing wine in the 1600s, but they didn't start bottling until the 1800s. Um, and they've hidden, I'll show you the house again, they've basically hidden a high-tech winery inside these beautiful old buildings. Uh, the buildings date back to the 1700s, and they are absolutely incredible. Um, they've got about 800 acres, no, 800 hectares, I think, um, but only 100 of them are planted to vines. They've got cattle, they've got, um, they get people doing filming there, so it's really amazing. Um, and if you do go to visit South Africa, a strong, strong, strong encouragement recommendation to go and visit Rustenburg. Um, so the next wine, for those of you tasting along, I know that Ben's only got the uh, Rustenburg this evening because this was a last minute addition over the last few days. But if you are tasting the Aslina, um, lucky you again. It's a little more affordable than I think than Rustenburg, but only by about a pound or so. Um, the slight there are some differences here. So it's Stellenbosch fruit mixed with Elgin fruit. So uh, Stellenbosch, where our first wine was from, Rustenburg, mixed with um, uh, mixed with the Elgin fruit, which is coastal, and is it brings a bit more lightness and freshness to the blend. They do still barrel ferment it, and it has ten months in barrel on the lees, so slightly, slightly less time. Again, when you've not got really, really rich fruit, you don't need as much barrel, or certainly the fruit isn't designed to be barrel aged quite so much. They oaked slightly less of it as well. So uh, I think it's about 25% actually went through oak and the rest didn't. And all of the oaked fruit, I'm sure, is probably the Stellenbosch stuff because that would have been richer. Slightly on the fresher side, so it's more leaning towards that. Um, the the, the flavour profile is still very similar, but that richness to me is what is um, going to, um, sorry, the less rich style is one, what's going to cut through I've got cheese in my fingers, is what's going to cut through the um, gooey, unctuous acidity as well. So there's two slightly different styles of pairing, but I think flavour wise, concept wise, they're quite similar wines. And Chardonnay is um, a lot of things to all people, but these two are definitely uh, playing side by side, even if this is a slightly fresher style. And then this is produced by the most incredible woman. Uh, and she was actually the first um, black winemaker in uh, South Africa. So her name is on the front of the bottle, which is, and I do apologize if my pronunciation is terrible, but Nitsiki, and it's such a shame because um, I'm probably making a mess of that, um, Biela, um, but she's become a, a huge success at the Wine Society. Uh, first female black winemaker, as I said, and we absolutely adore her wines. So um, she's fabulous. The wines are great. And you'll start to see a lot more of her wines on the Wine Society. So I thought I'd include it today. So, Ben, over to you. You're going to um, hopefully tell us about the cheese and then we can talk about the pairing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is St. Jude. Obviously, it says St. Jude on the bottom. But it's our only um, individual cheese, we call it, um, this evening. Um, so this is made in Suffolk. It's made on Fen Farm, um, where Baron Bygod is also made. It's uh, raw milk. Um, it's a soft, very moose-like, um, um, yeah, cow's milk cheese. It's made with Montbelliard uh, milk. So Montbelliard, um, Montbelliard breed are very well known for Comte, Vacheron Mondor, um, but also Brie de Mou. Um, and the reason they have Montbelliard in um, Suffolk is because Johnny Prickmore brought them over to make Baron Bygod. Um, now, Julie um, started her um, cheese making career um, making Tunworth. So she kind of invented Tunworth with Stacey Hedges. Stacey Hedges now still runs, um, runs Tunworth, but um, 
but Julie moved on after Tumworth became pasteurised and is a huge advocate for raw milk. Unfortunately, um, recently Baron Bygold has had to be pasteurised, so it's going to have to pasteurise for the next um, six months at least. But um, but Julie's cheese will still uh, still be still be raw milk. Um, so the make of this cheese is, is pretty incredible. Uh, you might see that in the texture because it's so mousse like. And to, to form that texture takes a lot of dedication. Julie gets up at 2 a.m. Um, to start the process. So she takes the evening milk at 2 a.m. Um, obviously, the evening milk is about six, um, but she takes it at 2 a.m. and she starts the process. And the, the, pro the process isn't using rennet. So rennet changes um, milk to curds and whey very quickly but Julie uses lactic fermentation. And um, so you, she uses lactic acid within the milk um, to produce her cheese, which makes this gorgeous, moussey texture. Um, on the outside, you have slight um, kind of white, slight bloomy that you see on a brie, for example. Um, that's penicillium candidum. Um, she uses very tiny amounts, and then she also uses geotrichum. Geotrichum is the wrinkly, you might be able to see, it, it differs cheese to cheese, um, but you might see more wrinkles on your cheese or you might see more um, of the white candidum. Uh, but basically, um, both of them put together, candidum produces a beautiful white coat, uh, contains the paste, but geotrichum brings more complexity to the, to the cheese, whereas candidum can be quite bitter. So if you buy a very heavy white rinded soft cheese, then you might find that it, it is quite bitter. And that's because it's all candidum and not geotrichum. But geotrichum is very difficult to manage. Um, so yeah, her, I mean, her process, she starts at 2 a.m. in the morning and it finishes um, around three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, they're left to drain overnight. Um, and then they come back the next day and they're um and then they're put into maturing rooms um, and um and yeah the, these are about two or three weeks old and um, i mean the texture is unlike many other cheeses i mean it's absolutely beautiful it's so moose like the rind is so thin and it's incredible let's get a rind so thin you taste it tastes where it's from, it tastes like Fen Farm milk. It's quite rich, but again, it has that acidity towards the end. It has that, those citrusy notes. You know, it's quite, it's quite deep in flavor. It's, it's a bit cowy to begin with. Um, it reminds me of the cow shed a little bit, but towards the end, I definitely get more acidity, very much like the wine, like, like you were saying, Anna. Um, I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. I, I, I could eat the whole thing. I, don't know. <laughs> I love how moussey it is. And what I find interesting, Ben, is something you just touched on that I hadn't really maybe considered in my head. I've picked two, uh, the two wines that I wanted with this cheese are um, warm, sunny. Well, warm is the wrong word. They're not warm, warm climates, but they're certainly sunny climates. And that tends to produce the sort of sweeter nature of fruit. So we're not talking about a Chardonnay from Chablis here, you know, with green apple and tartness. And I think what you just mentioned about the, the being less bitter. Yeah. I think that's actually where, probably where my brain went. Because I think I tasted the cheese and I thought, mm, this needs something really sweet and rich and giving. Yeah. And these wines aren't sweet, but the nature of the fruit is sweet. So yeah. they've got a kind of, um, yeah a giving uh, generous, more orchard fruits and kind of um, moving into tropical fruits, which I think is, is really helpful with this cheese, actually. Yeah, I, I don't know how the climate's worked with wine this year, but I mean, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of the, the, you know, the, the animals have had, to, have to come in, you know, there's been no mm. grass for them to graze on this year. So they've been having to supplement them, you know, with a lot of silage and, and hay and, and so cheese has been a lot richer and, you know, you, you haven't seen, you haven't seen so much um, freshness in cheese that you'd expect in okay. some, 
you you find more rich, deeper flavors with, within cheese because of that, that is cheese. fascinating. I know. Yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. I get so obsessed with wine and how um, and how weather affects wine. I had I didn't even cross my mind yeah, that that yeah. would make an impact. So what a great fact. Mm. And we do have a couple of questions before we move on. And members, please let us know what you think. Um, I am going to do a poll at the end, by the way, on favourite pairing. Uh, but if you are tasting along, members, let us know what you think. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, Mike has asked, is this a vegetarian cheese? I'm afraid it's not, no. 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 Okay. Lovely. And Ian Maynard has asked, I'm confused. Geotrichum candidum is one species. Is it one species of... Is it a so penicillium candidum yep. is a mould and geotrichum um, is um, a bacteria and you use both of those together um, in very different quantities um, to produce the perfect rind but finding the perfect rind, especially on a raw milk cheese, when you have all of the bacteria running around from, you know, fr from directly from the cow, uh, you know, you're not pasteurizing anything, you're not taking any of that bacteria out, is um, is very difficult. And making a cheese that's, yeah, that has such a thin rind, um, and the breakdown is perfect. It's yeah, it's very difficult. But yeah, they're the, they're the two strains that that you see mostly. Okay. Rind. perfect thank you very much um lovely so we'll move on to the next one if it's all right with you we've got our next cheese and obviously our next single wine which is still for sale um so if you bear with me a moment members we are going to talk now about the el pacto from uh, Rioja and I was lucky enough to visit actually I didn't put any photos but I was lucky enough to visit uh, this particular producer in April and <laughs> I'll be honest I tasted this wine in situ having really indulged in the tapas bars of La Grogno the night before and the night before that and was planning to that evening and uh, sometimes just a nice plate of cheese is, is the best tapas in my opinion and I tasted this particular wine and thought, oh, I'm going to need, need to try this with a nutty cheese. Um, and I hope I was right, members. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's become a particular favourite of ours. And White Rioja in general is very much on the way up. I say on the way up like it's this new modern thing. It's not. It's been around forever. But I think there has been a resistance in the past to see Rioja as anything other than red. And of course, that's because the reds were so amazing. But the particular grape that most white Rioja is made with, or certainly a lot of it, is Viura, which they also call Macabeo in other parts of Spain. And um, it is the majority in this. And I think, if I'm really honest, they, there's been a lot of honing in on how to deal with Viura. It used to be quite a bland grape, or at least it was producing quite bland wines. But now it's making much, much, much more interesting wines. So there are some other varieties blended into this in very small quantities. So, so small, they don't even actually legally have to mention them. But they're things like white Grenache and a, a couple of other regional grapes. Um, the vines for this particular wine are very old. So 60 year old average and grown at about 600 or well, 500 to 600 metres. I'll quickly show you the vineyards. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a stroll around the vineyards of this particular wine as well. I did not take this shot, but I felt like this was the best example. The reason I say that is this bodega, so Bodega Classica that produces the Alpacto range, is um, is based in Sonsierra, which is a little subregion in the northern part, Rioja Alta, and it's very mountainous here. So you're up in the foothills of the um, of Tolona, which is basically part of the Sierra de Cantabria. So you've got altitude, and I think that might be, in my opinion, the key to White Rioja. You've got amazing coolness. It's a it's it's chillier up here, and the evenings are very cool as well. The soils here, and the reason I've included this, albeit grainy, rather helpful picture, is that they are clay based. So this is grown on a clay based soil, but that there's a lot of limestone in there as well. That it's very old fashioned grape growing for this producer, but with a very modern winery. So by old fashioned grape growing, I mean a lot of bush vines, a lot of low yields, hand picking, etc. And this wine was grown, um, was produced, sorry, quite interestingly. So 
They macerated the whole bunches for 24 hours and allowed the skin to then lay in contact with the juice for another six hours. Now, what, what, why should we care? Well, it's bringing that nuttiness. They're basically getting everything they can out of that Viura grape variety. And they want lots and lots of concentration. And Viura has this beautiful nutty aroma to it. Uh, that that plays really beautifully when you do add a bit of oak and a bit of manipulation. But it can be unbelievably simple if you don't do very much to it and the grape quality is not great. So we've got amazing quality grapes going into this very interesting pre-maceration process. For a white wine, that's quite unusual. Red wine's quite quite common or certainly more usual, and especially in places like Rioja, uh, where they want to get loads out of their Tempranillo and their red Grenache. But um, here, quite well, worldwide, quite unusual to do that sort of thing for for a wine that ends up looking. It's a little darker, I'd say, but than than some white wines, but certainly not that dark. After they've had this this extended skin maceration, they then press the grapes, they rack it away, get rid of all the the bits that it's been hanging out with, um, and then they allow the native yeast, so the natural yeast, to go through fermentation and it's quite a warm fermentation why is that important well again it gives all of this extra extraction so it extracts other things if you wanted to produce more um there's a bit of floral in this but if you wanted to make a viola that was very floral and quite um fresh and light you might do your fermentation at I don't know, 13 to 15 degrees c probably on the cool side but this is at 16 to 18 so you get a different set of aromas and they are oh sorry they are going after those nutty characters that sort of um rich almost oily macadamia nut i get um it's got um some french and american oak large formats so not tiny little barriques that impart, impart lots of flavor it's a mixture of barrels so they were between 500 and 1000 liters here and it's had 8 months in those Again, on those fine leaves that the first wines had, bringing that texture. And it's I didn't intend to choose wines that all had leaves contact and that that yeast. But I think there might be something about that leaves giving that slight salinity that I really think works well with cheese. Um, so although it wasn't a coincidence, I think in my brain, actually, that's something that I clearly am I'm finding very attractive in cheese and wine pairings. So, um, yes, let's have a taste. Hopefully you're going to get that richness, that roundness. Uh, Julia said that white wines with a small amount of skin contact for texture, she loves. Yeah, I agree, Julia. They're really fascinating. But to give members an idea, when white wines have loads of skin contact, you end up with orange wines. Um, so there's, it's almost like a, a tool with a very long, potent, you know, you've got lots and lots of options. You can have a little bit of skin contact, a middle amount of skin contact, Loads and loads of skin contact and produce an orange wine. So I think this is a bit Goldilocks right in the middle for me. Perfect amount. Um, we've also had before uh, we have a quick taste because I guess Kevin might be um, Kevin might be asking because he's tasting along. But can the Manchego rind be eaten, Ben? I I don't think it would harm you. Um, I think I would I would try it with the paste. It will offer something different to the paste. It's a natural rind which you don't find very often. On manchegos you know you find a lot of time you have uh, plastic coat rinds on, on manchegos so the it, yes yeah try it with the rind try it with without the rind and, and see what you think perfect thank you so i'll just quickly on the tasting um for me it is that very very rich expressive indulgent quite salty actually on the palate in a really nice way very very nutty um it's more almost bordering on like red apple yellow apple for me um it's it has got lemon but not like the wines before it's a different kind of lemon it's kind of preserved lemon everything feels like it's been almost dehydrated in concentration it's really really intense um and I think for me the first two wines would be wines that I would gladly sit in the garden and have a glass of or even now at this time of year that could be like a pre-dinner wine they're quite rich but um the Asselina certainly is a pre-dinner wine I'd probably still have a glass of Rustenberg before dinner as well for me this is a wine that is crying out for food so on that note um please try with cheese and wine I'm going to hand over to Ben to talk about the cheese 
Thank you. I just taste those together and they are delicious together. <laughs> Good. Um, and the nuttiness in the wine as well. It's like, I just say that like oily tasted kind of nuts. And, yeah, really beautiful. Um, so yeah, so next is Manchego. Um, so there are, um, there are lots of Manchegos and it's what Spain's most popular cheese, I, I would say. Um, our Manchego is from Para family. Um, so Manchego is always sheep's milk. Um, this is raw. Um, so it, it's raw milk and it'll be traditional rennet. Um, so not vegetarian again. Um, it's made in La Mancha with Mancha um, sheep. So there are two types of Mancha sheep. Um, there are the white and the black. Black Mancha nearly uh, went into extinction, but the Para family brought them back. And they're really small uh, yield. So not a lot of uh, not a lot of milk at all, but really rich. Um, you find on a lot of manchegos that you see, and especially in Spain. I mean, I was in Andalusia a few weeks ago, and you go, you know, you go to the the deli, and they have so many cheeses that look just like manchego. But it's really rare that you find one with a natural rind over a plastic coat rind. Um, and there's nothing wrong with plastic coat. Um, Plastic is great for not letting bacteria in, so it will never go blue or shouldn't go blue. Um, but it won't add anything to the flavour of the cheese internally. Um, so a natural rind will let the um, will let the oxygen into the cheese to ripen naturally. So you will taste more of where it's from if you have a natural rind versus a plastic rind. Um, yeah, I find it super rich. I mean, it's it's so fatty, isn't it? It's sheep's milk. It's the most fat, you know, fatty of, of any of the milks. But you still have a really. It's like a. And I was thinking about this with the wine. It's like a. A tingling acidity. It's like it's kind of like dancing on the side of your mouth, just like the wine does. It kind of like just tingles either side and you get that richness, especially through the nose, fatty. I'm definitely herbaceous as well. You find with Manchego, the older they are, the more waxy they get, and so the darker in colour they, they will be. And you find that in most sheep's milk cheeses. Um, but I think because Manchego is, is so popular, um, it, it's, a, it's a good example of, of how sheep's milk um, matures basically this is a semi corrado so semi corrado is three months old um and you have um anejo um and you have curado so that three six and twelve um so yeah i haven't actually tasted it with the wine yet um for me ben what i really like about this is um a, a bad manchego is often really popular but it doesn't taste like too much. And I think this has got a sort of subtlety about it, but it's the texture that blows my mind. Yeah. I just think uh, it tastes like a quality cheese. Yeah, and yeah. it's so easy to find, I don't know, mediocre manchego. But I think when you are prepared to spend a little bit more on manchego, it just makes the world of difference. Yeah, it kind of melts, doesn't it? And, mm. and usually it's a little bit more waxy. It's like, there, I mean, there are so many not great examples of Manchego and it's, so, and it's so easy to pick up a Manchego that isn't of such quality. Yeah, but when you taste something like this, it's, you know, you can tell that a lot of love has gone into it and they really care about what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Roger and Jeannie said particularly good Manchego. Yeah, and, nice. uh, Yeah, Sandra said great, great, and also liked the match too, so. Yeah, the pairing is gorgeous. I mean, it's a bit of what grows together goes together, isn't it? I was, it, it was, I did pester you, Ben, for a Manchego for this event purely because I knew that I wanted to do this wine and I had it in my head that it was going to work because I'd had this culinary moment where I needed to, to show this wine with a Manchego to members as I tasted it. So thank you for indulging in my Manchego dreams. <laughs> and that's it pairs beautifully. You get I don't know, that vanilla-y, nutty-ness 
through the wine even more so with with the cheese i think it's so i don't know it, it's so full in your palate it's it coats everywhere it's yeah it's beautiful and uh lucind and ernie have just said that the aroma of the rind itself is wonderful and ian agrees i i totally agree it's very um it's got a really unique smell I felt bad when I was cutting it up earlier. I gave a piece to my dog, but I won't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no more for Roller the Terrier. I think if you can if you can eat the rind, I think just just try it. You know, if you have a cheddar, cheddars or our cheddars have to be minimum twelve months old, and mm. they are you know they're they're larded, for example. So they're larded right at maturation, then they're wrapped in um, cheddar cloth, and then they're minimum twelve months. Now, do you want to eat lard that's, you know, that's 12 months old? At least I probably, I probably don't. But for cheeses that are three months old and they just have a natural rind, I just give it a go, and, you know, and soft and wash rinds. I mean, wash rind, you have to eat because it's the whole point in the cheese. And, and, you know, soft, always eat rind. If you can, if it seems edible, then cut, then eat it. Yeah. Um, Catherine, actually, on our last session, I don't know whether you do this, Ben, but on our last cheese session, um, I think when you were literally in, I think we were sort of at birth moment. Right. Uh, but Catherine oh, and I tried was. to pull off. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Catherine and I tried to pull off a cheese event, the two of us. And we did quite well. But the most enlightening thing from Catherine was that she uses rinds in a lot of her cooking. So she yeah. would chop up her manchego rinds and things and then chop them up really finely and, and use them to flavour. I can't remember whether she said bolognese. But any members that were on the uh, on the call and do the same, I know there were lots of people that said we use our rinds in cooking too. This feels like one that would be particularly good in cooking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you get a certain bitterness from that rind, I think. But the bitterness mm. in the rind with, with that really rich, decadent milk, you know, in the paste, I, I just think it goes so well. Yeah, I, I, think, I agree. You know, yeah. Um, Robbie has asked, is the Manchego organic? Yes, it is. Yes. Should have mentioned that. Yeah, there we it go. Is yeah. Lovely, <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry, Ben, I was talking over you there. Yeah. There aren't there, there aren't many cheeses that are left that, that are organic. It's, it's very difficult to do, but um, they're really ah, okay. so, Yeah, wonderful. Good question, then, Robbie. <laughs> uh, right, so uh, we're going to go on now to the next wine. And I'm conscious that I would like to try it with this cheese as well. I've actually just eaten all of mine. <laughs> um, no, sorry, it's the other way around. Sorry, I want to try the white wine with the cheese. That's good because I've just eaten all of mine. So that's very handy. You could probably interchange the members if you wanted to. Um, although I don't think I've got that on my um, on my poll at the end. But if you wanted to, you can. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the Chianti, and then the second of the Spanish cheeses, which Ben's going to pronounce perfectly for me. And then, uh, but if you are interested, I thought because it was Spanish and Spanish, why not try the um, try the white Rioja with that cheese as well, which we can all do. So um, I'm going to give that a try now before we even talk about the cheese. In fact, no, I'm not. Let's talk about the wines, and then we can do both uh, both wines with the cheese, the white and the red. So we're going to talk about the Chianti Classico. Uh, now, this, again, was a wine champions winner, and it was also a decanter bronze medal winner. Um, so a well-awarded uh, Chianti. Chianti Classico naturally being the original region of Chianti. And that's really just important because it's in the part of the Chianti region that has the best sites for producing what I would call classic and obviously the name is Classico, which is supposed to supposed to embody that, although there's an argument that you don't have to. But this one is a particularly classic Chianti. So we should be expecting um, all of the all of the hopeful notes that we get in in a Chianti. This actually has had 10 percent Merlot added to the Sangiovese. That is very normal. Um, if you poured this at the beginning, well done. If you're only pouring it now, can I just suggest you give it a really good air because it's it's not closed per se, but I think the aromas need a little bit of time to warm up. So really do give it a swirl if you haven't pre-poured it. Mine pre-poured is really coming to its own. Um, but the soils here are, this is the, the uh, producer. The soils here are um, 
stony, so very, very stony, quite hard to grow. And again, I think you realistically, I think you can see the soil the soils are of the stony variety here. They're not very dark. They are quite um, quite pale topsoils. It's again a, a producer that has a little bit of altitude. So you are getting more of that uh, freshness because of the diurnal range. So the temperature difference between day and night. So at about 350, 400 metres above sea level, you end up with warm, sunny days, uh, warm, sunny Tuscan days, followed by um, cooler evenings. And that maintains the acidity in the Sangiovese, which is actually really important. I believe this producer used to use 10% Cabernet Sauvignon. Don't quote me on that, but I'm almost certain that they shifted to using 10% Merlot. Both are permitted, but what I would say is, if I'm putting words in uh, Fattoria Motecchio's mouths, I would say that they're going for that more elegant and lighter style. So what you're going to expect here are not your big blockbuster heavy Chianti. You can get a lot of Chianti in that style. Instead here, it's more floral, it's violets. The tannins have been softened. It's... um. It's had 12 months in oak, but not in bot like not in barrique. It's been in big 25 hectolitre wooden vats. So the wood has not imparted flavour. It's just given a little bit of micro oxygenation, which softens those tannins over the 12 months. So for that reason, don't expect the very, very um some Chianti's that have seen a lot of wood can give you a um uh, not vanilla it's more like anise and quite spicy note whereas here it's more for me herbaceous than it is spicy and that herbaceousness is coming from Sangiovese more than anything um but it has got that lovely violet um more more floral character to it which I adore I'm bordering teetering on the end of a licorice root but um you know it's not fully licorice it's just that lovely ever so slight touch for me, I'm going to say something awful here. Cherry cola. <laughs> and I, I often get that with, I think I've said it before with some Sangiovese wines. It's packed with cherries and it's this lovely like fresh cherry. And cherry cola has in it those sort of ever so light spiced flavours. So things like your cinnamon and, and uh, things like that. But it's also quite herbal if you ever decide to have a cherry cola. If you remove the sugar from your brain, it is quite a herbaceous drink, actually. So for me, that's what it's got. Um, <laughs> yeah, Star and East, Bridget and John have just said, I completely agree. It's that slight aniseed touch, that slight ever so, um, it's, a, it's a hint of spice and lots of herbs, but it's not too um, full packed with your peppers and those sorts of spices. It's much more on the aromatic uh, sweet spices, should I say. So I'll have a quick taste and then I'm going to hand over to Ben with the cheese and then I'm going to try uh, the white with the cheese and the red with the cheese as he talks. But um, I think don't expect, I've lost my spittoon, don't expect a huge mouth filling wine here. Oh. Sangiovese is a very refreshing high acid grape. And because we have seen 12 months in big old oak vats, we're going to have the softened tannins, but we aren't going to have all of the tannins that come with oak aging as well. So, hmm. Ah, oh, I love it. Now it's bitter cherry where those sweet spices have have not come away. But now I'm getting this lovely bitter cherry that screams Sangiovese and Chianti to me. And it screams I want food with me. It's really mouthwatering, really refreshing. I think hopefully the, the cheese is going to bring even more of that sweet fruit and sweet spice to the fore because that is the key with Chianti. If you're drinking a Chianti that you think is, naturally Sangiovese is quite tart and bitter. And if you think, oh, that's actually a bit too bitter for me, that's why you have it with beautiful cured meats or, or, or a truffle pasta or a mushroomy pasta with loads of salt and Parmesan. It's because you then bring out the, um, the fruitier side of the Chianti as well. So without further ado, because I'm too excited to try this now, um, I'm going to hand over to Ben, who's going to talk to us about the cheese and hopefully members, you enjoy the pairing. Thank you. So this is the cheese that has been changed. Um, so originally um, it was going to be Burkeswell. Um, so um, 
I, I mean, I absolutely love, I, I love Black Swan. And I, I was, in fact, I, I was there yesterday. But un unfortunately, sometimes in, especially in our stand, cheese world, things happen. And unfortunately, you know, you, you can't, um, you can't foresee um, people being poorly or, 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 you know, not being able to um, fulfill orders. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Ram Hall, they, they only have um, a certain amount of staff and that is a head cheesemaker and two sidekicks. And between them, they make the cheese, they do the raffinage and they um, pack the cheese and send it out. And so if, um, unfortunately, if, if one of them's poorly, then, you know, something has to give. And, you know, there's always going to be milk. Um, so you always have to make cheese. And so the last thing that can happen um, that they, they have to give up is sending cheese out. And so unfortunately we didn't get the cheese in early enough for you. Um, and so we had to change it. Um, but we changed it to Garochta, um, which is how you pronounce it, I think. I mean, my Spanish is horrendous. So, I mean, that's how we pronounce it at work anyway. Um, so it is, it's new to us too. Um, this year we've done, um, we, we've changed our European range quite dramatically and, and we've, um, we've included a lot more European cheeses and, and this is one of those. So I, I personally think it, it's quite good to, you know, get some feedback on this cheese when we haven't really been selling it very long. You know, we've been selling it for three or four months. Um, so it's goat's milk and it's pasteurized. Um, it's traditional rennet. Um, so again, not vegetarian. Um, it's from Castellan, uh, from Grochter, but it was only revived to the name of Grochter in 1980s. Before that, it was just a farmstead cheese. It was just a cheese that you made um, as a cooperative, as you do mostly in Europe. I know we've spoken about it before. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll briefly go through it. A, a lot of the time in Europe, um, many farms bring their milk together. Um, and they, um, they're really good at um, looking after their livestock and milking, but they may not be cheese makers. And so they send their milk, they collect their milk and they give it to a dairy. The dairy makes the cheese um, and um, they're very skilled at that. Um, and then they will pass it on to an affineur who will mature the cheese. Um, so it, yeah, it's very, it's very, um, very similar to a lot of how, how the French work. Um, the Spanish do um, something very similar. So it was a, a farmstead cheese revived to the name of Grochte in the early 1980s. Um, it has a mucor rind, um, which we haven't seen here this evening. So it's that kind of furry rind. Um, you see it on Cafili, um, on Tom de Savoie, on Saint Nectaire. Um, so yeah, kind of furry, velvety. Um, I mean, flavor wise, I haven't tasted it yet, but I mean, the cheeses vary between four to eight weeks, um, which means, you know, originally it means that they could eat them fairly quickly. You know, you could, you could store them for a long time, but you could also eat them, you know, pretty early. So I expect that it's pretty fresh, goaty, quite herbaceous. I mean, I expect to be, you know, munching on some herbs and, um, but I mean, we'll see. So, Ben, I have to say I'm really glad that I forced people's hand to try it with the white Rioja as well. Um, it goes, it does go with the red. It's strong enough. And I think that's sometimes the point. Chianti being not the strongest wine ever, but it has it packs enough of a punch that it is going with the red. Um, but it is also really beautiful with the white Rioja. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, Viora is a, uh, you mentioned it was from Catalan. Fiora is Macabeo in Catalan, so they do produce a hell of a lot of Macabeo. Um, in fact, much more than, um, I don't think it's more than the region of Rioja. Um, but the, the yeah, they don't call it Viora, they call it Macabeo um, in Catalan. And it goes, it's, it's in huge amounts of their white wine. So I'm not surprised that those two work really well together. This is probably, and I'm, I'm not clued up but this is probably a pairing that would actually happen you know if you're down in Barcelona and, and having a glass of Macabeo then you would probably have a cheese like this personally 
but it looks like members are agreeing as well that it's a good pairing so actually it's ended up being a bit of a glorious a, a, I don't know fate has aligned me to t- try these two things together and I think it's fabulous it works so well doesn't it and the pairing is so different with both of them hmm. you know they offer something different with you know the cheese offers something different to both wines basically you, you get something different from each I mean yeah I mean, it's that, got a lovely texture again. I think a lot of the time that's what really spots a, a fine cheese for me. And here it's got, um, you know, it's it's definitely very different in texture to the other two, but it's still smooth and quality and, and um, yeah, it's great. Ken actually says he prefers the Chianti. I think we had somebody else prefer the Chianti too. I'm just happy that it worked with the Rioja as well. I, I hoped it would. I had I read about the cheese when Ben told me about it and then I thought, hmm, I have an idea. So I'm just glad it worked with both. <laughs> I've seen Michael's point there about um, his sister-in-law being vegan. I mean, yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, none of them are, are vegan because obviously all got milk in them. Um, but uh, none of them are vegetarian either. Mm. And I think that's quite normal in fine artisan, artisanal cheeses, right, Ben? A lot of them yeah. do use rennet. Yeah, I mean, um, I'd say the majority of European cheese, vast majority, um, is, um, is traditional rennet. Um, yeah. I mean, we mix it up a little bit in the UK, a little, a little bit more, I think. I mean, there are less, I guess there's, there's less choice in the UK than there is in, in Europe. And we're more bothered by it, I think, from a government point of view. Yeah. Um, yeah, but in, you know, it, it kind of makes sense because it's, it's, you know, all about tradition and using your animals and, and what you've got. And so traditional rent, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, that was a real find for me and I'm delighted. That's a lovely cheese. And it fits with the autumnal theme as well, because it is that slightly nutty. Well, the reason we wanted to pick some some cheeses that were semi-indulgent. <laughs> um, they're kind of getting in the rich, getting in the nutty, getting they all work with these wines that are not the huge blockbuster wines, but are edging your way towards the richer wines of the season. So um, yeah, it's like Decadence light is how I'd describe this then. (laughs) Uh, So on that note, we'll probably go to our most decadent final two wines um, and arguably cheese, I suppose, although I think we've had a few decadent cheeses. Um, Mike's just said, why only semi-indulgent? You're quite right. It is indulgent. It's just a different kind of indulgent. Uh, Quite right too, Mike. Well done. Um, But let's start with our um, Beleg the. I have such a problem saying this word. Vergelegen. Vergelegen. Um, it's very hard to say after you've had a few glasses of wine. <laughs> but this is a, a cracking wine. Now, I did check today. Don't worry, members. We have got another vintage of this coming out early next year. Um, if you didn't manage to get your hands on it, I have to say, I think this is probably one of the best Merlots I've had in a while for the price point. Um, so, so I encourage you when it comes out next year, keep your eyes peeled. Vergelegen specialise in um, uh, Bordeaux varietals. So they also make a Bordeaux Cab blend. They make a majority Cabernet Sauvignon. They make reserve versus regular. They make, basically, they make, a, I think it's about 20 wines. Um, some white or, as well, Bordeaux varietals. So they make Semillon. They dabble in a few things like Syrah as well. But the majority of what they produce focuses on the Bordeaux varieties. This particular wine is 86% Merlot, so you can label it legally as Merlot, even though it does have a couple of other bits in it. It's actually got 9% Cabernet Franc and 5% Petit Verdot. So even though they've labelled it Merlot, it's actually pretty pretty much a representation of a right bank Bordeaux, where Merlot plays the key role, but Cabernet Franc, and to a lesser extent now Petit Verdot, but certainly Cabernet Franc, plays second fiddle. Um, Why? Well, Cabernet Franc adds this amazing um, kind of acidity, freshness, really herbaceousness, and it marries very nicely with the more plummy, juicy, fruity side of Merlot. And I think in a warm climate like Stellenbosch, and we're back to Stellenbosch again, I apologise, but I obviously thought with these sorts of cheeses, they work well. But, um, you know, with, with the sunshine in Stellenbosch, I think that the 
the Cabernet Franc in Stellenbosch is such good quality that I think it's very smart to have nearly 10% Cabernet Franc in the blend here. Um, even though it's three varieties, there's only two vineyard sites and the names of them escape me. One of them is Stonepipe and I can't remember the other one, uh, but two vineyard sites. And here we're fermenting at a high temperature to extract lots of that colour. So you'll have a look at it and it's inky dark, but it's inky dark with a lovely red rust around the rim. Now, the reason I say that is because it has got a bit of age. It's 2016. Um, so we are going to start to see some developed characters. And you'll see on the note here, it's got savoury. And I think that's important because it is that slightly bit older. And also fruitcake spice. That fruitcake spice coming from a little bit of time in the bottle too. Um, we spoke a bit earlier about the white wine having pre-fermentation maceration to extract a little bit of texture and some of that kind of nutty character. Here we've got post-week fermentation. Um, sorry, post-fermentation maceration, seven weeks. Just wheat and fermentation, what am I on about? So for seven weeks, it sits on the skins and gets them pumped over. And that's also adding to that inky colour because most Merlots, if you had a right bank Bordeaux nine times out of ten, it's not going to look this colour. It's going to be much paler. Um, the other things I would say is it then goes into French oak for 16 months and uh, they're two two five litre barriques, uh, but well, barrels. So the same as what you'd get in Bordeaux. So they really have replicated a Bordeaux style here. A beautiful place, Vergelegen. I got it right that time. Vergelegen. Um, again, uh, looks very traditional, beautiful old building, but actually they are, again, are real pioneers um, of modern and clean winemaking here. To give you some ideas of stuff they're doing, you know, they, um, they're they drone mapping their vineyards to analyse them. So they take a drone around and, and analyse all the vineyard sites using that. Um, so they're very high tech, but very... Um, very, very high tech, but very humble, I guess is the way to describe it. But they do make incredible fine wines for an amazing price. We've just done a feature on Vergelegen, which is one of this wine was released as part of that feature. And um, I think we've only got one wine left, the Semillon. But I know that we have lots in stock being released next year. Um, so on the nose, someone's already commented on the nose saying it's amazing. It really is. It is fruitcake. It's spiced. It's, it's plum chutney with loads and loads of spices thrown in it has got that herbaceous slightly aged character it's got wood it's got a little bit of pepper cabernet franc and also petit verdot can sometimes add that peppery note and i think that is coming through here so it's not just the not just that juicy fruity yummy um, merlot now i won't ruin the pairing too much but i when i tried this i actually tried it with the cabernet franc and the merlot uh, cabernet sauvignon sorry and often you think, oh, the Cabernet Sauvignon needs the cheese to soften the tannins, etc. But this was just joyous. I tried this with about, I tried this cheese with about four or five different um, uh, gutsier red wines, because I do like a cheddar with something with a bit of guts sometimes. And um, and this one was the winner for me. It's not the most gutsy on the palate compared to some of the other wines I tried, but it is I mean, this is what Merlot should taste like, right? Everyone says Merlot's middle. This is far more than middle. This is a fantastic wine. So um, I'm going to have a taste and then we'll go into the Bogle, which is another prime example of Merlot. Mm. It's so unlike Merlot that I know. Mm. Uh, there's so much more to it. I think Merlot gets such a bad rep because, okay, on the right bank of Bordeaux, it makes some um, incredible wines. They're often quite long-lived. Um, and you will tend to drink them when they're a bit older. So you you miss almost like the fruity stage of Merlot, which is really, really good fun. And this has still got loads of fruit for 2016. It's yeah. packed full of fruit, but it is interesting as well. There's that development on it. Um, but I often think really good Merlot, young, is hard to find in Europe. Mm -hmm. I'm putting it out there. Um, maybe they got bored with it, they're not interested anymore, or, you know, the, the appellation doesn't let them, whatever it might be. There was a bit of a feeling in Europe that Merlot was middle. When you do your WSETs, you learn that it's medium acidity, medium tannins, me Merlot is medium everything. This isn't medium anything. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is you mentioned fast. chutney. You mentioned <laughs> chutney. It's like, it's like, chip, like, biting, like biting through that, that chutney, You're going through all those different fruits, all those different acidity levels. Yeah, it's, 
definitely not medium. It's, <laughs> it's not medium anything. <laughs> um, and likewise, the next one. So I'll just quickly mention the next one because I'm excited to do this pairing too. Uh, this is where we get into the winter warmer territory, right? Um, this next wine is similar. This is rich Merlot. This isn't wimpy. This isn't middle anything. Um, Bogle is an incredible good value producer from California. I would argue probably in the top five best value, really, because quite frankly, this is a gutsy, big, beautiful red wine full of indulgence for under £13. And it's come from California. <laughs> it was Bogle was started in the 60s by um, the fa same family that still run it today. In fact, did I put a picture of the family in? No, I put a picture of the winery, but I'll show you that anyway. Um, this is in Clarksburg. And for anyone who's done my recent um, sessions on, on California and, and Napa, Clarksburg is a good spot in California. So it's in the, it's in the northern part. And they only planted 20 acres and now they have, I think it's one and a half thousand. They did a really, really good job, but they don't just have their vineyards in Clarksburg now. Now, Clarksburg's going to offer the cooler climate, even though it's um, you think of the more Na more northerly Napa regions as very rich. Clarksburg's actually one of the cooler places. And actually, they go from the vineyards spread from Clarksburg all the way down to San Luis Obispo, which is a place I loved visiting when I did my California wine trip um really interesting really fun so you've got um here the actual blend is Clarksburg Lodi which is really quite warm and then Monterey back up in the north which is much cooler as well so um you've got a nice blend of different sites which is why they call it a California wine now the reason I mention that is because here you're kind of getting what you're it's similar to the Virg Galegan in the sense that you're getting this lovely combination of rich unctuous plummy but also with that high acidity and the richness and the freshness. So um, I just think I just it blows my mind that it's 13 pounds. For me, it's a um, it's a dinner party wine and Merlot. I've never known any Merlot to offend anyone, but often your cheap and cheerful Merlots don't inspire anyone either. And I think these two wines are what give me this sort of buzz and the excitement back for Merlot. Um, you can smell the American oak on this one, probably a little bit more than, than Virgilegan. That's just purely an age thing, I think. With the Virgilegan, I'm getting a bit more of the development. With this wine, I'm getting more of that kind of sweet um, vanilla and, and star anise, as Sarah mentioned here. But in time, and you can give this a couple of years, in time it will develop a bit more of that sort of slightly more savoury characteristic as well. So that's me done. I've done my wines. I'm excited to try both of them with the cheese. Um and I'm excited to hear about the cheese from you, Ben. Um, yes, again, yeah, great, great pairing. Love that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the cheese first. Um, so this is Montgomery's cheddar. Um, so it's made in South Somerset. It's raw milk. Um, it's made by Jamie Montgomery, who is third generation uh, farmer and cheesemaker. Um, so yeah, raw milk, traditional rennet, um, not vegetarian, again. Um, we select, um, or I, I select all of our cheddars, I select all of our raw milk British cheese, but, um, but this one, it's quite important, um, in terms of age with Montgomery's. Um, this is a picture of us, uh, selecting. So basically we, um, we go to cheese makers that are generally raw, um, um, raw milk cheese that is, that is hard aged cheese because in a young cheese that, you know you don't find that many nuances but you do it in, in, a, in an aged cheese um, so Jamie says that his cheese within um, within 12 to 40 months is in, his, in its adolescence um, so it doesn't it doesn't do a lot it, it, you know it, 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 it's a bit, a bit lazy um, doesn't really doesn't really go anywhere, but when it hits um, fifteen to eighteen months, um, it, it really it, you know it really starts to you know come into something. It, it starts to do some something for itself. So I select this uh, around 12, 13 months, um, and then we store it in our in our rooms, or Jamie keeps it for us um, until fifteen to eighteen months. And I just find that the flavours, so the more rich flavours, and a bit more salt actually comes through um, in, in its latter stages. 
it just starts to be a little bit more complex. I mean, it gets a lot darker in, in colour. I mean, colour doesn't mean anything flavour-wise, but it definitely get, gets a lot darker. You'll find in it as well that you'll start to get ingress from the rind. So, you know, in 12, 13 month um, cheddar, I mean, all cheddar that is from the southwest, you know, um, that's part of the Presidia, so Pitchfork, um, Westcombe, um, Montgomery's and Keynes, they all have to be minimum 12 months, it's just part, part, part of the Presidia. They, um, they always used to have to be made from milk from Holstein Frisian cows. Um, it was part of the PDA. Recently it's changed because Pitchfork is made um, from 20% Jersey milk. So they, they changed that. Um, but um, Jamie's cheese is, is 100% Holstein Friesian. Um, he also has Jersey cows, but he makes Eagle Shield from that. So it's a semi soft, reclette style cheese. Um, but I mean, flavor wise, I, I generally go. Um, I generally go really meaty, savoury with, with Montgomery's. Um, with, with cheddar, they, they use generally four star cultures. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's the same every week. Um, however, um, Jamie uses six because he makes six days a week. And they do that to um, basically... Um, for a thing called phage, and phage is a, is a virus, and phage comes from um, the milk, and basically, um, if you're using the same starter culture the whole time, um, it will get used to that environment, um, and it will start to um, attack the milk, attack the cheese, and so you end up with extreme bluing um, and probably rancid cheese. So. Especially in um, in aged cheese, they use different starters on on different days. Um, so yeah, so basically, when you go to select, you go to select different um, different days. You don't know what day you're selecting. Um, you just choose the cheese that you think is the best, or you think suits the profile of the business the best. So I generally go really savoury, and um, this is really savoury. Um, so you do like a blind hard. cheese tasting. Hmm? So you do it blind. Yeah, you don't you know. You don't know which. Wow. No, you have no idea. But it generally works out that you or that I um, select the same days every time, <laughs> which is great to know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, and I, I do the same with with all our cheddar, and it seems that I generally pick the same cultures out every time and I think it's just the cheese that I prefer um but with, with you know with, with with all the cheese you get more bluing you get more mic damage and so you know you know you get you're going to find that through the rhymes it's always going to happen I found with the pairing that uh, the interior of the cheese obviously more acidic um didn't go as well as having the outside of the cheese do you find the same? Do you, do you? Yeah, I did, and it was that really lovely, like almost the hardened bit right by the rind that yeah. was the best bit for me. Yeah. Um, is that any saltier? Oh, or am I making that up? I do don't you have know. Blue in yours? Uh, sorry. Do you have any bluing in yours? Yeah, a bit. I, think I might be adding a bit of the saltier element i think for me it is that saltiness that makes it really fun with this wine and yeah. um, robbie's mentioned the aged wine definitely enhances the cheese cheddar experience i think that's why i kind of like the 16 as an idea not that the 19 doesn't work the the bogle but the 16 for me is really fun because it's it's savory until you have the very sort of salty meaty cheese and then when you go back to the wine it's suddenly a fruit a fruit party um, so for me, that's why the pairing is really fun. I think sometimes, you know, sometimes cheese can bring out things you didn't see in the wine. And for me, the really sort of earthy, earthy more savoury cheeses have brought out the fruitiness of this wine. So yeah, that's why I'm, I'm a fan. Kind of highlights the fruit, doesn't it? Because mm, it so, does. so the opposite. 
exactly exactly it's that opposites attract thing and to be honest there are plenty of of um good wines that would go with this cheese i think as long as you play from a pairing point of view as long as you play on that you're never going to find a wine that tastes like this cheese you know it's not like earlier when i was trying to match the chard chardonnay with the saint jude because i thought you know they'd be similar you're not going to find a wine that could ever stand up stand up to this cheese so you need to play on um play on the sort of countering and opposites attracting or at least the fact that the salty of the cheese the more fruit you're going to get and that goes back to Robbie's point about aged wine enhancing the cheddar experience you know if you are drinking older wines with a cheese a cheese like cheddar your old wine is suddenly going to get this new lease of life and taste fruity again even though you might not have been able to get the fruit on your initial taste so I do think old cheddar and old wine is lovely Mm. yeah it's beautiful Love it. Mm. You mentioned, Ben, we have got a couple of questions and I'm conscious we allowed up till uh, quarter past here. Uh, sorry, contrast rather than opposite. You're quite right, Derek. I apologise. Yeah, they're not opposites. That would be weird. Um, <laughs> but certainly there is a contrast. Um, there are a couple of questions. And uh, the first one, we've just spoken about ageing. So just to double check, I think I understood this, but Nadia has asked, is there a minimum age for the maturation for it to be called Manchego? And I think you mentioned three terms about Manchego from memory. Yeah, so there's semi-curado, curado and nejo. Um, so semi-curado is three months, um, curado is six months and nejo is 12 months. Um, so really three months is, is your lowest. Exactly, yeah. To call it a semi-curado Manchego, you could <laughs> just call it Manchego and it could be a month old. Okay, great. So if you're not seeing those other terms, they might have been exactly. Yeah, exactly. Fabulous. Thank you. I think I'm. I found my new favourite, which is semi curado manchego. So I can't go back now. I'll have to try the other two. We'll do a sort of aged manchego tasting with different aged white riojas. That would be lovely. Yes, <laughs> um, everywhere. David has asked um, about, we spoke a lot about penicillium at the beginning. And he's asked if, I wonder if somebody has an allergy to penicillin, would that be an issue? No, it's not. So even with uh, rock foresight, I think, um, you know, a lot of of people that have um, an allergy to penicillin, um, it's not necessarily the same strain as that's in um, that's in that's in blue cheese. Now, mm-hmm. I would never tell anyone with an allergy um, that they're fine to that they're fine to eat it, but it's a different strain, and so that's completely up to them. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you don't know that they're not allergic to this strain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful. Oh, that um, Bogle Mallow is getting better with the cheese actually Hmm, interesting um so i have got a poll just to finish off um ben unfortunately you're not allowed to answer the poll but i will um it won't let you because you're a panelist but i'm going to ask your opinion after the poll if that's all right but members if you are able to click on your screens i'm going to launch it now i've obviously put either chardonnay or either chardonnay because most of you unlike me won't have two so it would be whichever chardonnay you have with the saint jude the white rioca with the manchego the white rioca with the garocha i'm going with will that be okay Ben? yeah sure <laughs> the chianti with the garocha um or your merlot with the cheddar so I'm going to allow a couple more moments for voting. I will also say, and this is very important, I have allowed multiple choices because we don't want any family arguments or friends arguments. Um, so <laughs> if you, um, yeah, if, if there are more than one of you, you are allowed to vote multiple times. Right, so I think that's probably it. I'm going to end the poll. Oh, we've still got a couple more coming in. I think there's some debates going on. Whilst we... Um, since lots of people have answered, yeah, they're still coming in. So I'm going to ask you first, Ben, what was your favourite pairing? Mm. So tricky, isn't it? Because it's like, because um, I eat St. Jude and I think, oh my God, it's so gorgeous. And it went so beautifully, you know, with, with the wine. It, for me, it is between, 
which won't surprise you. <laughs> between the first one and the last one. <laughs> ah, I thought so. The English cheeses. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but no, I, I really, maybe I'm going to go, um, I, I'm going to go with the with the cheddar, I think, and the merlin. And I really love both of them as well. I really love that merlin. And it was a bit of a, a bit of a surprise for me how much I liked it. Good. Yes. Merlo is not just the, the middle wine. Lovely. Right. Well, I'm going to end the poll now and I'm going to share the results because we had an unbelievably even split. Wow. So um, we did have the Chardonnay win. Uh, so you were you were bang on the money there, Ben. Then the White Rioja and Manchego next. And then the final three were really all pretty much tied. Um, so we had the White Rioja and, I mean, arguably the White Rioja and the Chianti combined did very well as well uh, with that cheese. And then the Merlot and the Cheddar. So, yep, Deborah said first and last for her as well. I think there's a few people agreeing with you there, Ben. So, um, but I'm delighted that all of them got such such good scores. And I'm particularly delighted that the, the new entry um, from the Spanish cheese, our last minute, absolutely held its own against the wine so if you are going back to to your colleagues and telling them whether the cheese can withstand a wine pairing I think the answer is firmly yes yeah what was your <laughs> um so I'm a sucker for that Chardonnay so I probably would have gone with the Chardonnay and the St Jude and that's mainly because I think um uh oh I've just been asked how many were on the call we had 98 on the call so uh from 98 answers that's uh that was the results um oh not me I've been, oh yeah actually we would have we might have had more answers but 98 people on the call 98 screens on the call is what I should say but I guess if there's people with multiple putting in multiple answers we could have had I don't know maybe 200 if we'd really if we'd really um done a proper poll but yeah for me Chardonnay was probably my favorite I have to say the Manchego and the White Rioja really stood out for me as a transport back into time and I imagined I was in those Legrano tapas bars so I think my husband is going to enjoy that pairing the most because I think it's going to just be like being being back in a yeah back in an amazing Pinchos bar in, in the streets of Legrano so but amazing and the cheeses tonight really were fantastic I think a lot of people have said that the cheeses were really stand out tonight Ben so I can't thank you enough and all whilst managing uh new parenthood life so i really do appreciate it uh for members who are looking forward to the next one of these we're doing it slightly differently next time ben is picking his perfect christmas cheese board not telling me what the cheeses are sending me them and then i'm working out which wines so um i'm excited mm -hmm. and so we're going to indulge in ben's perfect christmas cheese board and we have just decided on the date so it will be going online probably tomorrow members so if i can get it online before i send the follow-up email that would make sense but it will be uh we have just agreed the 15th of december so keep that date in your diaries but as always you can watch the recordings as well so thanks again, Ben. I'm delighted I gave you a Merlot that was a not, not a middle ground Merlot. So yeah. I hope that you can go and enjoy it this evening. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you'll probably want an early night. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alan. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you all. See you soon, members.